It is now time for us to leave the islands of Haida Gwaii and cross the treacherous waters of Heket Strait. Being relatively shallow, it is susceptible to storms and violent weather and has a nasty reputation. Happily, the weather is calm for our crossing. We make landfall on the British Columbia coast in the rock-strewn entrance to Griffith Harbour. Spaghetti is a popular dish at the end of a long day underway. The sauce simmers in the invaluable crock pot without running the generator. The following morning dawns foggy. We fly the drone for an overview of our surroundings. Kayaks are ideal for exploring this maze of rocks and islands. With tides exceeding 20 feet, inlets dry out alarmingly fast. Right now there is ample water, but these branches show how much the tide has already fallen. This funky lichen is aptly named Methuselah's beard. Here is the same area a few hours later. In late afternoon, the mist furtively returns from the ocean. Chris finds a cluster of sea urchins feeding on this piece of kelp. Kelp forests provide shelter, food and protection for thousands of marine species. Urchins devastate kelp forests but are normally preyed on and kept in check by sea otters. Sadly, these animals were virtually eliminated from the coast of North America by the fur trade in the late 1800s, and kelp forests have paid the price. A delicate sunset paints the skies over this remote and enchanting pattern of islands. The following morning, we thread our way between the rocks and head for other offshore islands on our way to Prince Rupert. We encounter another swimming deer this time about to go ashore smack in the middle of the center of the First Nation village of Kitkatla after crossing a channel two and a half miles wide. We anchor among the crab pots in the Sess Islands where the crew of a crab boat comes alongside and makes us a spontaneous and generous gift of some of their catch. We spend the following day at anchor 
in the Spicer Islands and tour the shoreline. Following a massive and unexplained die-off up and down the west coast, this sea star is the only one we see during our entire trip. We have become used to seeing trees growing in minimal soil, but this one has found a way to spread its roots over none at all. Especially along the coast, up to 50% of the trees are dead or dying, whether by bark beetle or stress from the lack of rain. Their bleached skeletons line the shore. We catch only glimpses of whales, but sufficiently often that we know they abound in these waters. We encounter a pilot boat as we approach Prince Rupert. Being so far north, the port is only 11 days from Shanghai by ship and 6 days to Chicago by rail. In this tight spot, only marginally longer than venture, Chris uses the remote control to bring us alongside. Built in 1912, this converted tug uses its tenders as thrusters to overcome a stiff offshore breeze. At the fuel dock, we take on 3,600 litres of fuel, our first since departing here for Haidegwai five weeks ago. Leaving Prince Rupert, we pass the busy container dock. In the channel, we meet a post-Panamax container ship inbound from Asia. We anchor in Eyre Inlet on Anger Island. Somebody must have been feeling very out of sorts when dreaming up those names. The entrance into the anchorage is tight. Christine mounts a lookout for rocks. The following morning, reversing our course, with the dawn sun in our eyes, we cautiously thread our way back towards placid Princip Channel.
Logs are an ever-present hazard in these waters, requiring constant vigilance, precluding travel at speed or at night. We anchor in Langley West Cove on Bernard Island. Steve and Christine go ashore for an expedition through the dense forest. The rest of us scout the shoreline for items of interest. Spooky weed lies draped like a green shroud over stranded branches. Monstrous moss and strange shapes hugs the tree limbs. Silver ripples dance across the surface of miniature inlets. Evidence of shoals of tiny fish numbering in their thousands. Jellyfish of all shapes and sizes pulse aimlessly, vulnerable to being sucked into the generator cooling inlet. Is it our imagination, or is that the cry of a wolf? as the sun's orb descends into the blackness of the forest. Fluorescent green weed glows along the shore. When we come to leave, a blanket of mist obscures the constricted entrance channel. Jagged rocks slide past just inches from the hull. This one resembles a lurking crocodile, lying in wait with rocky jaws, ready to ensnare Venture's hull.
logs provide an additional and unwanted hazard. The exposed shoreline is piled high with trees and logs waiting for spring tides to float free and resume their peregrinations. In Campagian Sound, we catch a glimpse of humpback whales and two pods of orca. Their activities are monitored by the Whale Cetaceans Research Center at Whale Point on Gill Island. Here, Herman Mouter and Jamie Wright, assisted by volunteers, monitor a network of hydrophones. We call the center on the VHF to report our whale sightings and tell them we have photographs. Herman comes out to venture on his boat and within a few minutes identifies the orcas. Rain starts to fall as Steve takes the tender along the shore of Cameron Cove. We hear a vessel named Hawk Bay calling the whale center on the VHF. This is a boat we have been advised to look out for, so we make contact and speak to Stan Hutchings. Stan is the last remaining creek walker who is featured in an excellent film made by Rose Koch and Roland Gocket. Stan is nearby and agrees to meet us in Cameron Cove. Once aboard Venture, he tells us he has seen very few salmon this year. We ask Stan which of many fjords we should visit, and he says we would not be sorry if we visit Gardner Canal. We revise our plans to take advantage of his suggestion. Heavy rain starts to fall. Our initial disappointment turns to excitement as we enter Gardner Canal and a world of magnificent waterfalls fed by the downpour.
we anchor for the night in Chief Matthews Inlet. Here we catch glimpses of permanent blue ice fields high above. It is tricky to get the anchor to hold in the steeply sloped bottom at the end of the channel. We let out almost all our 400 feet of chain. The following morning the rain has stopped. Skeins of mist cling to the slopes of the surrounding mountains. Smaller rivulets have ceased. Major falls continue to flow, but at a reduced rate. We backtrack to Oakumish Bay, where we anchor opposite the waterfall. We take the tender up the Prim River. Rapids. Rock walls bear the scars from the glacier that gave birth to this natural wonder. Dull dolphins briefly join us on our journey south. Very nice boats. Yeah. 
On the eve of crossing Queen Charlotte Sound, we anchor in Schooner Cove and go ashore. Here, fallen trees provide nurseries for new generations. Fireweed heralds the approach of the end of summer. The day of the crossing dawns calm. Cross the strait to Port McNeil, where Steve leaves us on a direct float plane flight to Seattle. For ourselves, we follow the coast of Vancouver Island to our home base from where we started two months and 1,800 nautical miles ago. Venture has, once again, brought us safely home.